Thank you, Valerie, and, um, and thank you very much to, um, I'm going to say to Julia for the invitation, but from the organisers for the invitation to come and talk. Um, so I'm a, a, more of a biologist, so I always feel slightly daunted coming to talk to mathematicians. Um, and I'm not going to talk about very much maths, but what I'm going to try and do is frame that some of the uh, challenges from what we know about zoonoses and their transmission into, into humans that I think frequently gets overlooked in debates around pandemics. Um, and I'm going to start off by um, reminding you um, of a few things which I am sure that you all know. So please um, excuse me for that. It's not I'm not trying to teach you to suck eggs, but I think it's important, um, this background information. Uh, I've already disappointed Julia. Um, I've given myself my wrong title, and I haven't got any pictures of bats. Um, I work um, with Olivier and, and a bunch of international collaborators on um, bats and bat viruses and um and are going to talk to you from um the, the, the standpoint of, of trying to understand more as, as much about the qualitative drivers of zoonotic transmission as much as the quantitative um, drivers of it so something you all know already is that um that uh, the majority of human infectious diseases have animal origins um, and that's particularly the case for emerging infectious diseases and that wildlife, as Julia told me this morning, are, uh, bats in particular, um, are a particularly important source of potentially pandemic um, or very serious uh, zoonotic viruses. And th there are a couple of papers here that I refer to. The spillover of these infections into the human population is patchy globally. Um, that there are, um, if we can learn from retrospect retrospective studies of first emergence, um, when we can learn a little, and I, I think that the, um, the fact that there are patterns is more important generally than specifically where the patterns in this paper were, and then get into a kind of an afternoon long debate about some of the challenges of doing these sorts of studies. But I think the point is that, uh, that I'd make is that many of the um, hotspots, uh, if they are genuine for emerging infectious diseases, occur in the tropics in frequently in low and middle income settings. These are um, emerging infectious diseases that had been um, discovered by the time that Kate Jones and her, and her collaborators published this, this work nearly 15 years ago. Um, there are estimated to be one to two million further animal pathogens that are yet to be discovered or characterized. Quite a lot. So things that you know all about, thinking about how to mitigate future pandemic impacts um, and from the standpoint of these things being likely to have come from an animal reservoir. So vaccination, um, we've got the responsive vaccination option and the, uh, and the proactive uh, uh, option. And there's a lot of interest that you'll be aware of in, in trying to uh, develop cross-reactive vaccines um, against families of pathogens that are known to exist in animals and, um, and that history dictates are more likely to spill over. Um, Obviously not novel medical treatments, and, and I think it's interesting that, that there are likely to be some coming through um, to deal with the, the current uh, monkeypox or whatever it's now called, um, uh, global caseload, um, that uh, in a way that perhaps haven't come through in, in huge numbers during the, uh, during the pandemic against the, the coronavirus. Um, that's the, the larger pox viruses um, present more targets for treatment than some of the smaller, um, more rapid RNA viruses. Um, immediate implementation of non-pharmaceutical non measures in the face of emerging infection outbreaks. And a key question here is how fast is fast enough? And I think since Neil um, Ferguson published his, um, what, what was one of the earliest studies looking at um, H5N1 avian influenza emergence, um, using data from Thailand in around 2005, I think that we can learn quite a lot from global responses and their governance and the speed of change of that governance um, from the swine flu, the H1N1 uh, pandemic from 2009, as well as the COVID-19 um, pandemic and its emerg emergence at the end of that year in the beginning of, of 2020. Um, given our globally connected world, um, if we have a pathogen with an R0 um, more than a little bit, uh, just slightly over, over one, I think that, um, that, uh, that the speed with which we can uh, 
intervene on a, in a global sense um, uh, to, to lock down either regions or, or, or globally um, is just too slow if you have a, a pathogen that's got a, um, a, a ability to transmit um, between, between people. And I think the, the idea that we can do this and this is our, our baseline response. Yes, you can mitigate the um, things, as, as you all know better than, better than me, in face of, um, of a pandemic, but thinking that we can stop it in its tracks um, in the region that it's emerged um, for reasons that I'm going to evidence in the rest of my talk, um, I think is um, hopelessly optimistic, um, uh, stroke completely unfeasible. I want to talk a little bit about preventing spillover infection events. And obviously, the, the strongest evidence is going to come from combining um, a number of these approaches. The point I, want to, uh, I wanted to make to you in relation to um, some of the, the options available to us um, is we need to know what, um, what animal, um, particularly wildlife, pathogens exist globally. Um, and so if we want to create cross-reactive vaccines, first, you know, against what is a, um, and we don't know that the answer to that question yet. Yeah, we know that, that common things is common and we might be particularly concerned about coronaviruses given what we've learned globally in the last 20 years, but it's more than just coronaviruses if we want to, um, if we want to have a, a, a response to, to a number of different, um, uh, different pathogens. Um, and the same uh, point for no novel medical treatments, you know, one antiviral will not cover um, all possible uh, virus or virus families. So a point that I would make is that um, contrary to what, what was suggested might be possible um, with a very um, healthy degree of optimism in 2005 with that, um, that earlier paper in Thailand, um, I think that if, if you have a novel infection that is spreading in humans, we should expect it to spread globally. Um, and I want to touch on, um, on the potential for that pathogen to evolve as well. Um, and I think what we've all seen, um, obviously, with the, with the current pandemic is, is uh, the demonstration in the face of a very high global infection load. And I think that that, um, that load is really important, is the speed that with which a pathogen can significantly um, adapt um, or evolve um, for greater transmissibility. And I'll come on to the evidence around um, detection and intervention at source. And so this, this is data that you all, all know. Um, and I've just picked a couple of, a couple of recent new, uh, news articles demonstrating, but every two or three months, we're seeing um, a new strain evolving when, for this uh, pathogen which which previously many coronaviruses or they had known they had the ability to adapt quickly um, in many cases in animal populations don't because the infection load is just not high enough and so you haven't got enough global drivers of um, uh, global events to drive all of these changes that we're now seeing for this ongoing global pandemic and yeah and more on the um, <coughs> omicron, omicron um, evolution within the within the omicron uh, waves so on the right is a, is a um, slide I used in my um, inaugural lecture um, from 2009, um, where it was picking data from the, um, from the uh, uh, or at least a slide, for, uh, an image from um, the initial uh, follow dynamic paper from uh, some years before that, where we identified that speed of mutation, efficiency of replication and virus population size were critically important um, uh, drivers of getting um, from a, uh, an, an organism that was not transmitting in one species to one that could transmit in that species. And its ability to do that depended to a very great extent on the um, extent of change required to get transmission in that new species. So, so for um, so something that, that uh, like um, avian influenza, which uh, at that stage we were talking about H5N1 and people were talking about initially 14 mutations, possibly it was um, close to, to three to six based on the work of um, Ron Fouché and Derek Smith and um, another group in the States. Um, that was a relatively tough thing, whereas where you only need um, one or two mutations, then it could ha happen uh, rather, rather quickly. So 
as I said, this is all um, information that you uh, that you know already, and I, and I think that that at that stage we were thinking that um, conceptually that these things might, um, with a high uh, population size be things that we could expect for a variety of different viruses, particularly RNA viruses, which have got the ability to evolve fairly quickly. So then some questions that have uh, um, emerged since um, 2009 is, why has the SARS-CoV-2 like virus MERS not adapted? This is a virus that's transmitting quite widely in dromedary camels in, in the Middle East, and there are many different uh, spillover events occurring from camels into humans and a reasonable amount of person-to-person -person transmission going on with that. Why did the West Africa Ebola outbreak not, not persist? And that was a, an infection that was very widespread um, in three countries in particular at different points of the, uh, between 2014 and 2016. And what happened with 2009 swine flu, the H1N1 virus that came from um, through pigs, probably from three original um, avian viruses, and, and I think that the, well, the answer to the last question, which you, you all know, is that, that that is now a seasonal influenza virus. Um, that started in the human population with the ability to transmit between humans. Um, apparently, um, soon after, it, it probably emerged from, um, from pigs in, in, uh, in parts of North America. Um, I think it's uh, one answer to the, um, the to the MERS question might be that the, uh, the the scale of infection has not been great enough to give enough opportunity for evolution towards greater transmissibility, um, and possibly the same answer is true of the uh, of what was happening in West Africa in from 2014 to 2016. Obviously, there have been uh, several new cases or outbreaks, some of, of a pretty big scale of Ebola since then, but they are effectively new outbreaks occurring rather than a continued um, uh, evolution of, of the virus causing um, that particularly large scale outbreak, um, which ended, uh, uh, which was more or less mopped up in 2016. So a question around detection and intervention at source actually, I think has to be framed in, in the context of how transmissible is the infection to start with? And actually, what we've seen with SARS-CoV-2 and swine flu H1N1 is if it's transmissible already, it's going to get everywhere. And then we have to deal with the consequences, which were relatively small for um, the H1N1. And we all know what the consequences of, of SARS-CoV-2 are still ongoing. Um, where the infection has not had um, that, that initial um, uh, ability to transmit between people at, at a high enough rate, um, then in many cases uh, it has been possible to control it, often with non-pharmaceutical measures. So now I want to think about um, uh, source surveillance data. Um, so the reason that we do surveillance, or one reason we do su surveillance, is, is a key defence against disease emergence is early detection. Um, that requires surveillance and that requires quite a lot of infrastructure, both technological and human. In many parts of the tropics, hotspots for disease emergence, in many respects, or likely disease emergence, that infrastructure does not exist. So research question, can we sequence pathogens from lots of people in contact with animals? So thinking that, that you know, rather than having to deal with one to two million, Let's try and find out what's spilling over already and not transmitting. Well, I think that that is a good thing to do in a research context, and that could, could be very informative. Um, I think that, that uh, tr trying to think about uh, genomic surveillance of, um, of things like pyrexic illness for people um, in high-risk areas, um, which actually technologically is now getting much easier, is something that's very interesting to, to consider rather than the focus on pathogens of wildlife, which many of my, my biology, biology and veterinary colleagues um, are often promoting very, very strongly. I think some of that is very good to try and ground truth the, the, um, any data coming from humans. But I think that, that we have human filters for pathogens that can replicate in us already. Why don't we use them? People say, well, we're going to be able to predict what the next, next pandemic is if we do enough surveillance. Well. We know um, what seasonal flu is, and we can't even predict what's going to happen next year. 
we can only really predict what's likely to be happening in Northern Hemisphere by looking at what happened six months previously in the Southern Hemisphere. So suddenly we're going to be able to, with a bit, bit more machine learning, um, we're going to be able to suddenly to, to tell you what, what occurs, um, what, 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 what's, what's going to occur next year um, with two million pathogens. I don't think so, possibly, um, well, who knows about it, um, but I don't think so in the foreseeable future. I just don't think that's feasible. So a couple of, couple of bits of data. I want to talk to you about um, a, a study that my colleague Freya Jeffcott did looking at health-seeking behaviour in central Ghana. Um, this is an area of, of uh, Western Central Africa uh, uh, as a region that is thought to have some of the better primary health care. She did a five-month ethnographic study with a, uh, with a small com community and looked at health-seeking behaviours. And uh, to summarise, um, the way that people interface with the primary health care services there, um, and I'm talking about the Western runs rather than traditional ones, actually provide, at the moment, little or no opportunity for detection of emerging infectious diseases. The only things that would trigger an intervention is if there appeared to be some form of transmission going on um, between humans. And I think that's, that's, this is really important qualitative social data um, to frame what we think about early detection. I recommend, I mean, it's, it's a really good read. Um, I recommend it to all of you. I want to talk about some work that Emma Glennon did, um, looking at Ebola surveillance data. Now, we know how big detected outbreaks are, um, and we know how transmissible this infection was in West Africa in 2014 to 2016. It's quite well characterised. Um, so we should be able to, well, should be able to, what Emma did is um, predict what the distribution of outbreak sizes should be, given how, how transmissible the infection is and the variance around that transmissibility. Um, and she used uh, two or three different measures of transmissibility from West and Central, um, from, from West Africa. Um, and because of the, uh, the, the the um, size of R naught um, coming from the, the estimates of transmissibility. Um, and I think I want I, I suggest rather than a focus on like, the, the quantitative methods here, um, I, I'm just going to talk about the qualitative. Qualitatively, you should have lots of, of single and dual case um, epidemics and very few big ones. And you see almost the reverse. So even for this most feared infection that should be the easiest to, um, to detect, uh, we probably have a, a, a chance of finding 10% of those initial spillover events. If we want to find things, we need far better primary health care. And if you want to have genomic surveillance going on, you're not going to get it to work unless you've got better primary health care. So we're not going to be able to intervene effectively at source if you've got an acute infection with an R0 much above one. So I think that we've got to intervene to prevent spillover um, uh, transmission, but that's tough because we're talking about um, uh, in intervening around biodiversity loss, extractive industries such as um, uh, mining, and also I mean, care with intermediate hosts. So we've got to think very much about live animal trade. I'm going to jump through this. Wildlife farming is not much talked about, but is very important in particular parts of Southern China. And uh, was associated with the origin of SARS, uh, the first SARS virus, might well have been first SARS-CoV-2 too. Um, and I think that the key element of wildlife farming is the long distance movement of, of um, wild animals. There is a role for massive investigation of pathogens of, of wildlife, but it's not going to be enough. Um, we haven't got any good cross-reactive vaccines against new virus families yet. Technologically, that might be possible, but we're a long way from it. So I don't think we should be thinking about this being a short-term pandemic intervention. This is much more of a blue sky um, science angle to think about pandemic mitigation. So I think it's really important to do what you're doing, to, to, to think about, um, but not solely focus on, but to think a lot about post hoc pandemic responses. Spill back into animals and then back, backward transmission to humans, is, it should be an important part of that and, and hasn't been much to date, but um, mink and, uh, and um, hamsters from this current pandemic provide the evidence that, that matters. 
if we want to do anything about uh, trying to intervene at source, we have to intervene, uh, improve early detection, and therefore early primary health care. Um, and the key point here is globally, we'll all benefit from that. And the people who'd have to pay for it under the traditional model are the people who don't have enough money for the healthcare services already. So we've got to do something about that if we want to, um, if we want that to work. I think there's a lot of work to be done to reduce spillover infection risk. Um, and there, there are some, as I said, some very difficult political um, need, uh, interventions that would need to be driven politically in order to, um, in order to deliver that. Um, and I think the point is that these interventions have been almost entirely ignored to date while we've been focusing on better vaccinations, better non-pharmaceutical measures and better treatments and so on. And I think that if we're thinking about longer term interventions, um, that should be really important. But Valerie, sorry, I've gone on too long. No, thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, very interesting talk. Um, one of the difficulties with WASCAL is surveillance data is often you need to collect it across multiple countries, multiple continents, multiple political divisions and regions. Um, and I just wondered if you had any suggestions or thoughts on how that might be achievable um, on such a large and often difficult scale, as you said, with terms of low resources in the areas where you particularly want it to be taking place. Thanks. That's a, that's a really um, good question. And I think that, that actually probably we won't be able to do it in a joined up way unless it's driven by things like um, treaties within WHO, but actually not just within WHO. Um, what we're now talking about is a quadripartite systems, which include um, UNEP for environment, um, FAO and OIE for animal pathogens and, um, and whatever the fourth one is. No, they're off all there. Yeah. So, so I think that, that, um, that, that we've got a lot of governance work to do there before that is going to be delivered and then all of the, the, the fun and games around funding it, who's going to pay, I think will kick in. Um, but, I, but, so, but that's a huge area in its, on its own. But I think that, that trying to do things piecemeal and just going off, you know, you can do that on a research basis, but if you want ongoing surveillance programmes, you're not going to do it um, through research programmes, you're going to have to do it through global agencies. Thanks for a really interesting talk. Um, one risk that I think sometimes gets neglected when talking about surveilling wildlife in particular is that if you're actually going out into the field and taking samples from live animals um, then and, and bringing those samples back closer to civilization, that could actually be the event that seeds a new outbreak. Um, and I've seen pictures of some researchers out in, uh, you know, in the jungle in Southeast Asia, not even wearing serious PPE whilst doing that. And it seems to me like that is potentially one of the most dangerous research activities you could do. If you are handling a, that kind of pathogen um, in a lab, you might need a BSL-4 lab. Um, but, and, and, the, and the benefits often seem very speculative. Um, and especially given that these, types of research being funded in lots of different countries, being conducted in lots of different regulatory environments. Um, could we clamp down on unsafe practices when, when sampling wildlife? Um, uh, is, it, is it feasible to do so? Yeah, that's, that's a really interesting angle, which then um, leads on to the, the, the obviously, like it, there's been a lot of discussion driven around the lab hypothesis, around um, lab origin hypothesis for, um, for the current pandemic. I think, um, we don't have governance to clamp down on this around the world. But if you look at um, the ability to influence it, the number of agencies that have actually funded this type of work are rather limited. And so I think that if, you, if you're driving behavior change of researchers internationally, um, you could do that quite effectively through a number of different funders. And, and actually, um, I suspect that most of them, um, and given, um, given the interest in this type of activity, um, most of them would be expected, most research groups internationally would, would, would want to be taking um, 
great care to, to stop catching these infections. I can tell you, you take quite a lot of care, you don't want to catch some of these things yourself. You know, it's um, in terms of putting it in context, though, in most cases, there are local people that have interactions with these species already. And you come in and do a study once every 10 years or once every five years. There's daily contact between these species and humans. So I think emphasizing research as a risk for doing it um, is we need to consider risk and mitigate that and take all appropriate measures to, to prevent it. But I, I think in terms of scale of risk, it's not something I'd worry too much about because seeing how people are interacting with wildlife every day, you know, it's, it's on a scale orders of magnitude greater than, than kind of the, the research group coming in with, even with patchy CP of PPE. But now it's a good question.